Hello everyone and welcome to the Speculative Wildlife Research Center. Today we are taking a look at a very interesting aspect of dragon mythology. Sapient dragons. Intelligent draconic beings capable of speech and even having a humanoid appearance in some cases, which we will be seeing as a part of our World of Dragons series. So please consider liking and subscribing if you like this video and maybe check the rest of this series to get some more context on this project. And now, without further ado, let's get started. After humble beginnings hiding from titanic predators, the Dracomorpha would evolve into a wide variety of forms that would conquer the land, seas and skies, transforming them into nightmares for many people around the world. However, we have yet to see many dragons that would come to have a somewhat more favorable relationship with humanity, such as the Smee, also known as Flamagens Dracosapiens, Dragon People, and even by the modern moniker of Dragonborn. They descend from a species of social living, fire breathing dragons that inhabited Eastern Europe which became increasingly adapted to the colder regions of Eurasia in order to escape larger dragons that would prey on them. This environment led to them regaining the feathery covering of their ancestors to protect them from the cold, especially around their wings, head and neck, as well as them developing a stockier build, more apt to resisting the cold around them, although making them much less efficient flyers. However, their greatest asset in surviving this environment was their use of fire. They would rip off branches and even entire trees using their weight and claws, and light them up to give themselves a source of heat. This social living and primitive tool use would eventually lead to the spark of sapiens, taking this species down a road few others have ever walked. The horns of the Zmi unlike those of other flying dragons, or indeed those of most dragon species, grow in a spiral, similar to those of certain mammals. This has a very important social function, as these horns will keep growing for as long as the dragon lives, functioning as an immediate and clear sign of their age and, in family-based social groups, their rank within the pack. By growing on a spiral, these horns can stay balanced in a way horns growing upright or backwards cannot, therefore not interfering much with their mobility. This constant growth, however, will eventually make them much heavier, limiting the ability of these dragons to fly. Young, stronger individuals are still capable of taking flight, but most elders will no longer rise to the skies, merely remembering flight with fondness and nostalgia. Like other fire-breathing dragons, this species' anterior limbs are its wings, its patagia held by two fingers and the other three being left free. In most Draconidae, these three fingers are used as support when the dragon walks quadrupedly, but as the Smee began using them to manipulate their environment, especially in regards to the collecting and arranging of material to light fires, this became much more dexterous and these dragons eventually developed bipedality. However, this did not result in a manipulating organ as flexible and versatile as human hands. While their arms have a very high range of movement, as befits wings, that of their hands and wrists is much more limited and even as their brains grew larger and their cognitive abilities increased, they were limited by their own dexterity. While at first manipulation was heavily aided by the use of their mouth, eventually the first tools were developed in a way that took advantage of their great strength and accounted for their limited mobility by using long handles with knobs that improved their grip, the tool itself being angled, even perpendicular to the handle to properly direct its force. Despite these tools seeming big and cumbersome by our standards, they are incredibly precise in the hands of a Zmi, allowing them to turn the pelts of their prey, such as mammoths, into protective cloaks. Given the presence of wings on these beings, 
These cloaks cannot fully cover the body as they do in humans, so the wings are merely hidden behind hanging flaps of fur. Their ability to protect themselves from the environment, as well as their building of shelters and fireplaces, help these dragons further venture into the cold wastes no other dragon and even few humans dared venture. As these dragons grew in intelligence and their social structures became increasingly complex, some fascinating shows of culture began arising. After slaying their prey, these dragons would begin taking and cleaning their bones, from which they would fashion not only tools, but beads and ornaments they would use on their clothes and feathers as evidence of the prey they had slain or the particular family group they belonged to, or sometimes simply as expressions of individuality. Their use of fire also became much more complex, allowing them not only to cook food but to create and refine medicine, and even create substances that would give their fire special properties, including blinding lights, poisonous mists, or even colorful displays. Amazing showings of ancient chemistry or, as some even call it, magic. In Smith societies, each dragon's fire is a very personal thing, deeply related to the individual and its lineage, and this fact is very important to whatever it has been used for. If a weapon was forged, or a meal cooked, or medicine prepared with a dragon's fire, it will be considered to have part of that dragon's soul and essence, and the origin of any fire will be tracked until the moment it has been extinguished so each individual knows what was made with its fire. While the ancestors of these dragons communicated through body language and simple vocalizations, as they developed and became more social, natural selection favored individuals capable of more precisely communicating with one another. This led to a key aspect in their evolution, a complex vocal apparatus that allowed them to develop a language of their own. While relatively simple and unrefined compared to the vocal apparatus of humans, it is still advanced enough for them to communicate most simple concepts they deal with in everyday life. For more complex and abstract ideas, however, they have a secondary tool, their capacity to produce infrasounds, which the Zmi call their inner voice. These infrasounds can add many subtle and vital undertones to a conversation, and the interplay between them and audible speech is a very important part of the way they communicate, with the infrasounds adding indications of mood, tone, and even directly contradicting their speech, something that has turned into a valuable tool in their poetry. Unfortunately, despite both species being intelligent and having a lot to share, the language barrier between humans and Zmi led to quite a few misunderstandings and even violent confrontations. After all, living in a world full of monstrous predators that resemble these species, humans were naturally on their guard when meeting them. While communication between the two species was eventually possible, the inability of humans to understand or even perceive most of their infrasounds and the Smith's inability to interpret human facial expressions has made coexistence very difficult, with both species rarely meeting aside from occasional commercial relations and very basic trade of information. And that's it for a speculative biology look into sapient dragons. Dragons capable of speech magic and forming their own cultures have been a staple of fantasy for quite a while now, but a similar concept can already be seen in mythology. Notably, Slavic cultures have quite a few of these, dragons said to be able to speak, to have a humanoid shape, and even doing things like falling in love with humans. Which, okay, sure. And this led both to their naming as the Zmi and to the determination of their distribution, also guided by the reasoning that sapient dragons would have a huge advantage in conquering environments where their non-sapient relatives would not fare well, such as the colder areas of the world. 
This also informed a bit of their coloration and design, but a good part of this was also just a creative experiment. While the biological side of things in this episode may have been mostly derived from what we've already seen in the Fire Breathing Dragons episode, the cultural side was very interesting to work on. And I tried to go into more depth than what we saw in episodes like those of Bowser and the Koopa and even the community beloved dwarfs. It was a very fun process to work on, and I would definitely love to do more takes like this in the future. So tell us in the comments, is there any sapient being whose culture you'd like to see explored in the channel? And as always, here's a big thank you to everyone who wanted to see this episode, and to our patrons and channel members for their support, with special thanks to Jenny Wolfie, whose suggestions and ideas really helped get this particular episode into motion. Remember, you too can join in if you want to support our channel. And you get some nice bonuses too, like seeing all of our creatures and videos ahead of time and helping mold them into shape. Or you can just like and subscribe, it also helps the channel a lot. And before we leave, why don't we take a look at some of the awesome art that has been sent by our community. And remember, if there's any type of creature you would like me to give the speculative biology treatment in the show, Please sound off in the comments below. Thank you all for watching, and see you next time on the Speculative Wildlife Research Center.